Finally, we turn to dictionaries. Dictionaries, of course, are books, and what we've been talking about so far are vocabularies which exist in people's heads and in languages. Human heads. Every human head that knows a language contains a lexicon of that language, and if you know more than one language, then you know the lexicon, your own personal vocabulary for that language. But the languages themselves also obviously have a, a totality of the words that belong to that language, and we've been looking at both of those. Dictionaries, however, because they're books, uh, can only ever be a partial representation of these. Uh, it's very rare to find a dictionary which is just the dictionary of what is in one person's head. Generally, they're an attempt to represent the dictionary of the language, the lexicon of the whole language, or part of that lexicon. Dictionaries are relatively recent books. They weren't around a thousand years ago. They basically were invented when the lexicon of a language got so big that nobody knew it all. And they also came into existence when more people became literate and society became more stratified. If you're illiterate, why should you want a dictionary? Well, you couldn't read it in the first place, but you just learn the words that you need to learn and you don't need any other words. But when you become literate and you can read uh, anything, you might come across words that you haven't come across before and then a dictionary can be useful. That's when dictionaries started to be produced only a few hundred years ago. What are they? Well, as I said, they're books. That means they're published by publishers, and publishers generally don't publish books unless they think there's a market for them. Uh, just try it. Um, bring along your favorite manuscript of your new novel and uh, ask a publisher, and they'll say, I'm sorry, sir or madam, I don't think we could sell this. I, I really, It's very nice, of course, but uh, there's no market for it. So publishers are looking for a market, and there are lots of different markets now because virtually everybody who speaks English in the English-speaking world is literate to some degree. But of course these books are not going to be complete. Nobody has a dictionary of all of the words of, say, the English language or German or French or Japanese. Uh, there are always words left out. It's interesting to ask what the process is whereby words are left out. Quite often the dictionary maker has more entries than they put in. They become selective. They say, well, this word isn't used very often, it's quite rare, and so we'll leave it out. In some cases dictionaries contain only a small fraction of the total number of words of the language. And the dictionary makers and the publishers that get together and decide that they want to publish only the high-frequency words, the words that everybody um, is likely to want if it's a foreign language dictionary. If it's a specialist dictionary, they might want to put uh, none of the common words in, but only the words that belong to a particular uh, profession, say. And, of course, dictionaries are not authoritative. Uh, dictionary makers make mistakes, the same as everybody else, and so quite often uh, you can find mistakes, particularly in bilingual dictionaries, uh, say an English-French dictionary. Uh, you'll think, no, that isn't quite the meaning of that word if you're the native speaker of one of the languages. Basically, dictionaries are produced for different purposes. If you go to an airport on your way to two weeks in wherever it is, where they speak a different language, you might pick up a little pocket dictionary just to get some basic vocabulary. Or if you're a professional translator, you might buy the best possible dictionary you can and pay rather a lot of money. Uh, each of these is a purpose. Going on holiday is one, and being a translator is another. And dictionary makers tend to make dictionaries for all the purposes where they think there are enough buyers. Dictionaries have gradually developed a particular format. We're very used to that, and we think that it must be absolutely the way things ought to be. But it's really rather arbitrary. The standard dictionary starts with the spelling of the word, followed by its pronunciation, 
followed by its part of speech label or labels, followed by all its different meanings uh, listed, well, because they're imperfect, at least some of its meanings. The daddy of dictionaries for English is the Oxford English Dictionary. The Oxford English Dictionary is one of the most remarkable books ever produced in English. It's huge. Uh, there are many volumes and each volume is fairly heavy. They're very useful for pressing flowers. It was started in the middle of the 19th century as a what looked like a comparatively easy task. That is, to take all the words of English that had ever been spoken and document the whole of their history from the first time they were written until now, the middle of the 19th century. That was done by parceling out books from different periods to people who cut out words and their context and provided the meaning of all of the words and they put them on little slips and sent them in to the people who were editing the dictionary. Gradually the slips got more and more and it became a huge undertaking and James Murray who was appointed as the second dictionary editor spent the whole of his life on the Oxford English Dictionary and it still didn't get finished. It was finished after he died it's well worth trying to find a copy of the English Diction Oxford English Dictionary somewhere in a library and spending half an hour just looking at a few entries and at this mammoth work that James Murray and all of his family and all of the people who read books for him uh, managed to get done. One of the most remarkable, there's been a book written about, uh, there was a an, person in a psychiatric institution in England who was completely mad, um, confined there for the rest of his life, and while he was there spent a lot of his time reading books and cutting out pieces for the Oxford English Dictionary. Then there are rhyming dictionaries. I just mentioned those because they're rather peculiar. What they do is they list together the words that rhyme. That's kind of useful if you like to write poems that rhyme. So sat is there with cat. Well normally sat and cat are a long way apart but in a rhyming dictionary they're together. Rhyming dictionaries are also very handy if you want to know about suffixes because all the words with the same suffix are listed together and you can find out what the bases are that a particular suffix um, applies to. You can also now get a lot of these dictionaries online. There are rhyming dictionaries online and the OED is available in a CD version and uh, you can look it up uh, electronically. Finally, there are thesauruses. Thesauruses uh, flick the dictionary around. Instead of starting with its spelling, they start with its meaning and they list together words that are synonyms or close synonyms. If you're writing something and you get bored with yourself using the same word, I tend to use the word obviously rather a lot in these talks and I keep thinking you mustn't do that. Can't you find another word? Well, I could look it up in a thesaurus because the thesaurus would mean that I wouldn't be as boring. I could use another word that had more or less the same meaning. A lot of word processors now have a thesaurus built in. So when you're getting to the stage of editing your work, you can highlight a particular word that you've used two or three times in the vicinity and say, I'd like another one, please, and the thesaurus will look up an alternative and your writing will tend to be more interesting as a result.